We're getting started. You'll see. Olivia, you are echoing. Okay, uh, that was my fault. Okay. I just turned off the sound. Um, I can't see you. Can you see yourself? I can see myself. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I've muted this device here. The computer. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Okay. okay. I think we're ready to get started here. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Welcome to the COVID nineteen. Burlington, Vermont update for Monday, March 30th. We are starting the third full week of the emergency here in Burlington, and we've uh, got a number of things to, to report as we start the week. I actually wanted to start this week on a note of cautious optimism. 
Um, the, uh, there is news from the West Coast where coronavirus first hit in this country. Uh, the city of Seattle, which saw uh, the first reported case in the country and where 37 of the first 50 deaths due to the virus took place. Uh, there is a clear sense that the spread of the virus is slowing. The hospital system there has not been overwhelmed as they have been concerned about out there, just like we are concerned about here. Uh, the, apparently they've come close a few times to being overwhelmed, but they've been able to keep it within, uh, within, within the range that they can manage. And um, the rate of transfer from one infected individual to others has gone down significantly. They were measuring that at 2.7, nearly three new people being infected for every one person that was infected. That rate is now down to 1.4. And um, both the mayor of Seattle and the governor are um, voicing some um, uh, real sense that the social distancing measures that they've had in place there longer than anywhere else in America are having the desired impact, which is reassuring. Uh, I think all of us, it's been on our minds, it sure seems like we've been doing a lot for the last couple of weeks with these social distancing measures to actually see it in the numbers and see it holding up for some period of time is encouraging. Uh, there was this also this graph from this morning uh, that about performance here in Vermont that also um, uh, was some indication and a very early and I definitely uh, on both of these the, both of these points by no means is my point that we have succeeded just that there is some sense that what we're doing is having a positive impact there in Vermont you can see the curve it's a little bit hard to make out in that graph but you may be able to see down there towards the bottom that the curve so far in the Vermont in a few days uh, since we've had more than um, 10 deaths, which is when this graph starts generating, is a flatter curve than some other states that we're seeing, which, uh, again, too soon to know what that means. But uh, I think after a weekend where across the city, we know there was a lot of efforts to social distance. I wanted to point these things out. Here's uh, another graph that we um, have generated that gives an indication um, of just what the impact social distancing strategies are having here in Burlington on Church Street. This is a daily traffic report um, generated by um, measurement of cell phones on Church Street. And you can see that over the last few weeks, the number of people on Church Street has dropped precipitously. In normal times, that way we would look at something like that and it would upset us a lot. Um, in these times, we see it as an indication that that Vermonters are listening, Burlingtonians are listening and working hard to, to flatten the curve and to bring down the rate of transfer. Um, Chief Morrison is here with us today. Uh, Chief, I know you had officers out throughout the weekend as well as a partnership going on with the Parks, Recreation and Waterfront Department to have other ambassadors out there. What's your sense for how the weekend went in terms of social distancing? You know, I think that in the parks, which is where we were primarily concerned with, um, that it went pretty well. Sunday was not such a great weather day. Saturday, a little busier. Uh, the Parks Ambassador Program, the recently rolled out uh, program, uh, felt perceived that uh, social distancing was significantly higher this weekend than last weekend. And I think that can be attributed to the states and the city's uh, consistent messaging about stay home, stay safe. Uh, an area that we're beginning to hear uh, anecdotal concerns about and also our employees are making observations of is in grocery stores and other places where uh, people can be, according to the executive order, but they are not practicing the six foot social distancing when they're in those environments. And some of that is, you know, your fellow citizen who's also grocery shopping or in a pharmacy or somewhere. And some of it is actually employees of those uh, businesses. So I think that as we prepare to go the distance in this marathon, it's not going to be over in the next couple of weeks probably, we need to really take time to reinforce the messaging to our families, to our employees, and to each other, to our peers, that this is serious. The six foot rule is there for a reason. Um, and we could go into all the epidemiological reasons why it, it is so, 
but people need to take it seriously. Don't run up and hug your friends when you see them in the grocery store. Um, don't encroach on others who are trying to take care of business and make transactions. So we're going to continue to be highly visible in the community and help educate folks. Um, but we will continue to ask Burlingtonians for their strict compliance with the six foot standard. Great. Thanks, Chief Morrison. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, and Chief, you made a point there that uh, I want to make sure was clear as well. Um, this is going to be a marathon. Um, uh, another development over the weekend is uh, even President Trump, who had been reluctant to acknowledge that these measures were going to need to be in place for a significant number of additional weeks, acknowledged that it will that that is actually what will have to happen, that social distancing um, from a national perspective is going to be in place through the end of April is what he is indicating. Um, I think local estimates are that it could well go beyond that. And that even when we start to come out of this, it's not like the day that there's gonna be a moment when everything just goes back to normal. Uh, we'll speak about this more in the future as we start to get a better picture of it, but in you know efforts to be candid and clear with people, I think we should start to um, prepare ourselves for the possibility that really for uh, a number of months, maybe the better part of a year, maybe longer than a year, uh, we are going to uh, be needing to be very vigilant about this virus. We are going to, there may well be um, future uh, episodes of social distancing, even when we come out of the initial one. This is something that we are going to need to get used to and be in for the long haul. And the city's going to continue to do whatever it can to help educate, inform, and ensure that um, uh, that this com the community has what it needs to succeed with those strategies. So um, I'm going to transition to a new point now, um, and, but it's related. Uh, because of these social distancing strategies, uh, we have new demands on um, all sorts of systems. And one of those is the system whereby we feed our elderly. Uh, we have long in this community had a Meals on Wheels program. We've long had efforts where volunteers help get meals out to elderly uh, members of our community who are confined to their home. Those demands are higher now than they've ever been because more of our older neighbors are spending more of their time in place. And we, we know that this is an illness that really affects older uh, Vermonters, older Americans, and we have many uh, members of our community who are really trying to uh, avoid going out of their homes at all. There's a great nonprofit here in town uh, known as AgeWell. That picture up on the screen, I do want to point out, is not a recent picture. This is from uh, this is pre-social distancing period when we were um, when I was volunteering with Tracy Schamberger and um, one of our officers, uh, Carolyn, um, and uh, we were out and we delivered a number of meals back in the. Uh, I think this was in the in the fall, and we are joined by Tracy Schamberger today to share some thoughts on how Agewell is handling this crisis. Tracy, welcome. Thank you very much, Mayor Weinberger, and I want to thank the entire team uh, for including us in your briefing. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick little bit of background. Age Agewell is one of five agencies on aging in the state of Vermont. Uh, in 1974, the state de designated AgeWell as a agency for Chittenden, Franklin, Grand Isle, um, and Addison counties uh, in northwestern Vermont. Um, we carry out programs that are authorized by the Older Americans Act uh, that calls for obviously local organizations to take the lead in creating a coordinated system of services to help older adults in the state. So. Uh, we are uh, the, lead, the largest provider of Meals on Wheels uh, and uh, obviously deemed as an essential service. Um, <clears throat> we are seeing a significant increase in those needing Meals on Wheels as people socially isolate uh, and um, distance themselves as the most vulnerable population, obviously. That said, despite these challenges, um, we are want to ensure that older Vermonters we serve continue to receive Meals on Wheels and other services that we offer. So as an evidence-based 
program, um, I wanted to share a little bit of data uh, about what we've seen and particularly in the Burlington area. Um, so currently as of today in real time, we're serving about 1,025 meals per day. Uh, that is a significant increase uh, of a week, uh, two weeks ago when we started tracking, uh, our numbers have gone up about 27%. Um, in Burlington, just to give you a sense, in Burlington last year, we served 6,163 meals for the year. In March of this year, we're approaching about 7,000 meals in the month of March. Uh, we also have a wrapped services uh, program, which is our care and service coordination program. Last year, we served about 400 people in Vermont in the year. And this time this year, we are serving about 538 people. So we've seen about a 10 to 12% increase uh, in those numbers and people reaching out. Um, I want to encourage people to spread the news that um, none of the services that we have been offering are in any way suspended. We continue to offer our services, but perhaps in a different way. So we do have a helpline number. Uh, I can uh, make sure that everybody uh, knows that it's on our website. It's one 800 642 5119. If you have a neighbor, um, someone in your community, someone in your family that you want to get services for, call that helpline. We are completely well staffed and our team is not only able to answer questions about all sorts of things like Meals on Wheels, but also Medicaid and navigating insurance. Uh, they are experts. They're well informed on COVID related insurance issues. And I want to make sure that nobody um, goes without feeling like we, there is a resource that can absolutely help them. Um, the other thing I just wanted to quickly mention is that we are delivering extra meals to our clients. Um, typically, you know, we do 60 routes a day at, at 23 different hubs. And part of our goal is not only to provide um, uh, food to people, nutritious food to people, but also to make sure that we're checking in with people so that uh, we know that they're safe. Um, that is continuing, uh, but in perhaps a, a slightly modified way, which is our volunteers go up to someone's door, they uh, knock on the door, they are wearing gloves, uh, they step back from the door to ensure that uh, there's a, a safe a distance between the client and the volunteer, and then they ensure that the that the client has picked up, has received their meal. That's the daily check-in that's incredibly um, important. Um, one thing that we have uh, also implemented as our care and service coordination team is continuing to serve our clients, but they're doing it remotely and only when home visits are deemed essential. So uh, that is really important. If a volunteer does not see a client coming to their door and it happens regularly where someone doesn't come to the door, someone from our helpline and our information and assistance line calls to check in and then they make the call whether or not a visit is deemed uh, essential. Um, the other thing that is happening is we have uh, had a significant, as you know, and thank you very much for uh, calling uh, attention to the need for volunteers. We've had about a hundred volunteers drop out. Um, we understand because our volunteers are an average age of 70. And those volunteers are uh, obviously some of the most vulnerable people in the community delivering to the most vulnerable people in the community. So with the efforts of lots of grassroots organizations and businesses coming together, um, we have now 107 new volunteers that have stepped up within the last week uh, to be able to start to meet uh, the need. So in Burlington, um, I know that uh, there's obviously an increased demand uh, because in part it's a more condensed population. Uh, and those volunteers are really stepping up. Um, and uh, we want to thank that group of people. So 
Um, we do have a great group, by the way, uh, uh, to the chief who I know is there, the Burlington police, the South Burlington police. It's really nice for our clients to actually see um, the police delivering Meals on Wheels and they have really stepped up in a big way. So we want to thank you for that. Um, and then the last thing I want to just sort of say is that we have finalized an agreement that will allow the state and the other AAAs to link to our contract with our food uh, vendor. Uh, we just placed an order for an additional 40,000 frozen meals that we are storing in uh, freezers that we've rented. And uh, so we don't have to worry about food production. We're going to keep that engine going. Uh, and, um, you know, we expect obviously that uh, this uh, need is not uh, ending anytime uh, soon. So uh, we are uh, transforming our onboarding process for our volunteers. So as they come in, we've done really innovative things like create videos and all sorts of things like that. Uh, and we also approved uh, that through our partner, uh, the Department of Aging and Independent Living, that we can onboard a younger group of volunteers. So 16 to 18, as long as their parents attest to the capabilities that uh, they have a driver's license and that we can uh, check them out uh, to make sure that they understand our process. And uh, so the long and short of it is that um, the costs and efforts needed to protect seniors require additional emergency funds. Um, we're asking federal lawmakers and corporations and foundations and the general public to remember vulnerable seniors and we're working hard to deliver a vital lifeline to our most at-risk population um, as we see the need uh, increase and support continue to rise in the coming months. But we're all coming together and we're getting it done. So please reach out to AgeWell if there's anything that we can do uh, for your uh, older adults in your community. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you, Tracy. So um, reach out to AgeWell if you know older adults that need help and reach out to AgeWell if you have some ability to help volunteer. The, it's a quite a, quite a striking statistic, uh, Tracy, that you've lost 100 volunteers. It makes sense. It sounds like so far things have gone well in terms of filling that need, but um, one of the reasons we want to feature this program is because it provides such a, an essential service and because there is, I know there's so many people in the community who've been saying they want to help, they want to do something. This is a, a concrete way to get involved and, and have an impact. Um, why don't we, Jordan, Olivia, just uh, before moving on to the rest of the program, are there any one or two questions for Tracy from uh, the members of the media or the public? I have a question for yeah. Tracy. Can she hear me? I can. Tracy. Great. Okay. So you said obviously the number of meals has been up during this pandemic. What's really been the most challenging part in keeping up, I guess, with the spread and as seniors are important during this? Well, I think obviously volunteerism is, is you know, we're asking um, more people to deliver, uh, you know, more meals. We have more, uh, uh, we have fabulous partners in the community that have food hubs, but um, a lot of the places where we would typically deliver, I think one of the challenges is senior housing. I mean, we, we, we can't get into senior housing. Uh, the need for meals in those senior housing facilities has obviously increased. We are working with those partners. We are getting them meals. Uh, no one has to worry about that part, but I think, you know, just keeping up, we use one vendor in Rutland uh, Trio that delivers all our meals. We have to do that to follow the older uh, Americans Act for nutritional guidelines and just having that engine constantly go with creation of uh, more and more and more meals. It's unusual for us to order 20 to 40,000 additional meals, but we're going to keep it going knowing that, um, you know, we have uh Obviously, we're working with federal legislators to get uh, increased funding for Meals on Wheels, and our donors have been incredibly generous in the community. I think, you know, obviously, knowing that uh, the increase for more meals is, is not going away. Um, people that typically would not have been on Meals on Wheels in the past absolutely need this essential service. People are feeling more isolated. Calls to our helpline are increasing. People are nervous. Um, and so, um, you know, we're well-staffed. 
Uh, our staff is very agile, and I think that they have really stepped up in terms of switching job responsibilities to, um, you know, we're cross-trained, luckily, but, um, you know, I, I, I just think, you know, it's a large population. Vermont has a huge older adult population, and now more than ever, they can't get the services. They used to be able to go to community meals. Um, social isolation is a big deal, so we're really checking in on our clients uh, but I, I think, you know, meal production and volunteers is prob are probably two of the most critical issues. Thank you, Tracy. You're welcome. Okay, Tracy, if you want to stand by, we may come back to you. Let's uh, yes. hit a couple other topics. Um, uh, so you just heard, if you want to volunteer for AgeWell, you can contact, contact them directly. There are other volunteer opportunities, many other volunteer needs during this crisis. And the city's new Resource and Recovery Center is trying to play a role in linking up volunteers uh, with volunteer needs and to do so safely. And this next slide shows the new portal that has been created for both sides of that equation, the, the, the people who want to volunteer as well as organizations that have needs. There's the contact information. You can always find it easily by just going to the city's homepage. There's a link right there on the homepage to the Resource and Recovery Center. Um, the next slide is a slide that starts to capture the volume of requests, one-on-one -on -one consultations that have been going through the Resource and Recovery Center. We have Luke McGowan, who is one of the people heading up the effort at the Resource and Recovery Center and the head of our CETO office. Luke, can you speak to this graph a little further? Happy to. Uh, I've got it on my phone here, but uh, this is a helpful summary of next what you're seeing in terms of tickets requested. So anytime anyone calls the number at the recovery center or sends us an email, a ticket gets created in our system and then we can track now sort of what issues we're getting uh, called in about the most. Uh, what's clear and has been consistent throughout the recovery center, uh, you know, since it was launched, about a third of the requests we're getting are from small business owners and employers who are looking for help uh, Kind of getting relief, getting an understanding of what the financial assistance uh, that is coming online that's available to them, uh, getting an understanding for what's changing in terms of taxes. So that's certainly been something we've been focused on. We've also had uh, a number of requests for help navigating the unemployment insurance system. Uh, so we're fielding uh, calls there. Uh, and you know something that's interesting on this graph is and is encouraging too. The third largest group of requests we're getting is people saying, I want to volunteer, how can I help? And that's been great. So we can start, now that we have our volunteer platform launch, we can begin to match those uh, people raising their hand with the greatest needs that are out there. Before we move off this page, I do just want to pause on that notion for a moment that the, um, uh, the that people should reach out to the Resource Recovery Center if they're having trouble making their unemployment claims. This is really the biggest way, one of the quickest way that people who have lost their jobs can get help is by filing an unemployment claim. We had early reports uh, that the Department of Labor was overwhelmed in Vermont, as we've heard in, in other states. Uh, I think that they've been working very hard to deal with that and get uh, upgrade their web materials, but I just want to make sure the word goes out. If you're having any trouble accessing your unemployment benefits, get in touch with the Resource and Recovery Center, and we're going to do everything we can to help get that money flowing to you right away. And that right now is more than $1,000 a week uh, between the Vermont benefit and the new federal benefit that should be flowing soon. Let's, uh, let's go. We have another Resource and Recovery um, announcement to make. And uh, I'll just hit the top line and then let Luke, you speak to it further. This is, a, this is um, uh, uh, I think, a, an important announcement. Um, we have um, monies uh, that are within CETO that we are repurposing. And we're basically taking lo a loan program that CETO was already managing before this crisis hit. And we are uh, repurposing $110,000 as a grant program that is available immediately to Burlington businesses that are employing, either ret retaining or hiring low and moderate income employees. And this is uh, 
just the, the beginning. We are expecting hundreds of thousands, hopefully ultimately millions of dollars to flow through the Resource and Recovery Center in one way or another. Um, but this is one of the first uh, funds that we can get on the street and start to make an impact on four Burlington businesses that we know are hurting right now. Luke, what else can you say about this program? Uh, so again, I think it's important to note, you know, this is $110,000 we have uh, currently kind of sitting in our account to support small businesses. Uh, it is not going to be enough uh, by any stretch to support all of the businesses uh, employing low and moderate income employees here in Burlington. Uh, but it's a start and we already have a process in place to get this money out the door as quickly as possible. Uh, so we're now uh, on the website, live at the Recovery Center. There's a link to an application form, and this is a very simple application. You know, this is more, you can think of it more as a qualification rather than an application. So it's 14 questions, should take about five minutes for a business owner to fill out. And that's just to make sure that uh, that business would qualify for that assistance. We're gonna open that process, so it's now open. For the next week, we're hoping businesses uh, that are needing assistance, which we know is essentially every business here in Burlington, will take a look, decide if it's right for them, uh, put in their information, and then we think we'll be able to start turning checks around uh, within about a month. So we know it's, uh, it's not going to be enough, but it's a start. So we do want to use this also as a way to understand the need that's out there in our community. So it's another channel through which the Resource and Recovery Center can generate data uh, for our community so that when we're, when the mayor is speaking to the governor or speaking with our federal representatives about what we need, this is another good data point for you to use. Great. Um, final final um, announcement we want to make for today is a, an update on city services. We, uh, uh, like every other organization in the state at this point, in compliance with Governor Scott's order, have had to uh, uh, cut back on the workers, on our, on our non-essential workers, basically people that don't meet the definition that the state has laid out about essential workers, that we have had to further um, restrict the services that the city can offer. Um, <clears throat> there's a chart up on the website showing which services have been discontinued or uh, constrained in recent weeks. A couple new ones, just to point out, are in the clerk treasurer's office. We're going to have to stop providing marriage certificates, which require in-person contact, unless there is some kind of COVID-19 related or end-of-life issue that can't wait. In those cases, we will uh, attempt to um, make a, a schedule an appointment and, and conduct that appointment in a way that uh, is, is safe. We are also suspending land records appointments for the time being. This is another you know, very important city service that's really necessary for uh, any kind of land transaction, any kind of property transaction. So we look forward to being able to reinstate that. But for the time being, um, while we are under this stay home, stay safe order, that has been discontinued, at least for now. Uh, there's the website if you want further information about other city services. And with that, um, Jordan, Olivia, uh, we've gotten through the the PowerPoint. We uh, we take questions if there are. I know you said in the past, as far as number of cases go, we want yeah. to do that to the health department. But just wondering, over the weekend, have you heard any new cases in Burlington? Any really new numbers that are worth reporting? So the Department of Health does update their website um, daily. Uh, I believe they are still shooting to have those updates there by two o'clock every day. Um, uh, there may have been some, uh, that I think is the protocol and really to avoid any confusion or uh, conflicting information out of there. I think that's, that's the, 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 the best route for the, um, for those numbers. Okay. And how about as far as Burlington Health and Rehab any new movement there, getting residents out, um, just kind of tackling that outbreak? Yeah, so um, the, uh, so here's, here's where that situation is. First of all, um, uh, I uh, um, just wanted to share that I did have a chance on Friday evening to, for the first time, um, something I had wanted to do for some time was able to get on a phone call set up by Burlington Health and Rehab and speak uh, 
uh, to the, the, the family members and um, share with them uh, uh, how much um, I was thinking about them and their loved ones and that the city was here to support them in any way we could. We did get um, a couple of requests from that phone call of ways that we could support family members. And um, that is kind of certainly a standing invitation. We're here to help in any way we can. That's what the Resource and Recovery Center is about. Certainly anyone who has a loved one in there, if there's something that, that the city can do to help, we want, we want people to be in touch. Uh, my understanding is that where um, the status of that facility is, is that the people who can be removed, um, there are a number of patients that were moved out of the, the facility and are now being taken care of at UVM Medical Center in the hospital. Uh, there, uh, there are not current plans to remove uh, any more patients. The focus now is on uh, uh, ensuring that uh, the uh, facility does as good a job as possible in continuing to contain the, um, the virus within, within the facility. And, um, uh, there, you know, there are two doc doctors involved from the facility that, um, oversee that work and give direction on that work. There's also uh, been, uh, and I think here too, the department of health really can speak best to what exactly they've been doing, but there has been oversight from the department of health. Uh, at this point there, the, um, I don't have any further news to share about the Burlington Health and Rehab. The organization has put out some communications, and I think really they are the ones best able to speak in an ongoing way uh, to conditions inside the building. All right. Um, I guess the last question I have is Chief Morrison mentioned Vermonters are starting to really take the social distancing more serious. You said this is going into week three of an emergency in Burlington. What's really the main takeaway people should know continuing? <clears throat> so, um, so as we start the third week, I do see signs of, of hope that these uh, extreme measures that we've had to take are working, are having an impact. Uh, we are going to need to keep them up for some time. We're going to have to stay strong about this. We're going to have to stay vigilant. And um, we are looking at uh, some more weeks, uh, really at least through the end of April is what it's looking like uh, before there'll be a change in that status. Um, so I think as we start the third week, that is both, that's sort of the um, encouraging news and the challenge. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's daunting. We've never uh, in decades faced a situation quite like this. At the same time, um, uh, I see um, a lot of indication that this community has the strength, has resilience, has the creativity and innovation to make it through this unprecedented period. You see that in the Age Well report today. We, we, we are going to continue to share these really inspiring stories of various Burlington organizations stepping up, doing what needs to be done, individuals stepping up, and we're going to get through it. Chief, did you uh, want to add some? Yeah, so my – sure. <clears throat> You don't think I can talk loud enough for all that? <laughs> Just want the best sound possible. My main takeaway going into week three is that social distancing works, but our community is only as strong as the weakest link. Don't be the weak link. When I go out and I see people running up and greeting each other in the grocery store or employees of businesses huddled together looking at a video on a phone, that's the weak link. That's how household to household transmission happens. Don't be the weak link. Social distancing works, but we're only as good as our weakest link. So please, Burlington, please step up and be strong. Be patient. This is going to be a marathon, but we can do it. We can only do it together. Thank you. I have a question from Aiden Quigley at VT Digger, um, and this might be a question for Luke. Um, the question is, how will the city determine which businesses receive funds from the $110,000 fund that was just announced and what can businesses use the money for? So, good question. Thanks. Uh, so, this program, it's a restricted program through HUD, so it's a federal program that has guidelines around what type of employers are eligible. And that's what our survey form is on the website. If you take a look at that, it uh, makes clear sort of what the income requirements are. Uh, so we're doing this qualification to see which businesses are eligible. 
uh, and that's kind of restricted by the Fed. So we've been working with them to get additional flexibility. Uh, so we had conversations over the last few weeks uh, with our representatives at HUD to turn this loan program into a grant program because we know uh, businesses uh, really are in a position in a position to take on more debt, but the grant programs are more attractive. So we made that uh, made that work, and we're really going to do this as equitably as possible. But we are opening the process now so we can understand what the demand is, and that'll uh, that'll help shape how we distribute these funds. All right, Olivia. No other questions on my end. Okay, great. Um, thank you all for tuning in and uh, we will uh, be back in touch soon. Have, have a good night, stay safe everyone. We'll talk to you soon.